Good afternoon. I am Dr. Nordling at uh, Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne, and I'm very privileged to lead you through a study of 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 10, which is the epistle lesson for Pentecost for uh, proper 9b, which is uh, Pentecost 6, Series B. So uh, let's then begin uh, with the prayer, the collect of the day. We pray, O oh God, your almighty power is make, made known chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we may be called to repentance and be made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, once again, um, since we're working with the epistle lesson, um, uh, there's no immediate connection to the, uh, the Old Testament and the Gospel lesson. The Gospel lesson for this Sunday is Mark 6, 1 to 13, which is the rejection of Jesus at Nazareth and the, mis and the mission of the Twelve. So um, there's nothing really here in the, in the uh, collect of the day that pertains directly to uh, <laughs> the epistle lesson. I did underline almighty power because Paul does talk about his weaknesses and, and how he can rejoice and boast in his weaknesses. So maybe there's a very slight uh, connection there, but mostly I think this collect is based on on the gospel lesson as it usually is. So then let's, let's now turn to, um, let's turn to our text, which is 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 10, right at the beginning of the chapter. And uh, uh, Paul uh, begins with this kind of outrageous uh, statement, Calcastai uh, Dei. Uh, it is necessary to boast. <laughs> Calcastai day, okay? Um, and he has been talking about how he's going to boast anyway, and he's been talking about um, uh, kind of revelations and, and things like that. So he kind of continues the theme, and, and this is another outworking of that, I think. Um, so it's necessary to boast, uh, uh, not that it's permitted on the one hand, but I shall uh, go, Eleusimai from Erkamai, I shall go on into visions and into revelations of the Lord. Now, um, I don't know um, 2 Corinthians as well as I know some of Paul's other letters, but um, the whole time I was reading this, I was wondering if Paul is maybe being just a tad bit ironic, okay? <laughs> like he has uh, something in mind, um, especially when he's talking about such a man, as he's going to talk about here in the next few verses. Who is this man? And maybe is he talking about himself? And I tried to find that. Uh, in uh, some commentaries, and none of them took the bait. But I'm going to take the bait, and so that's kind of where I'm coming from, I'm afraid. Uh, so if we have this uh, kind of idea, uh, Paul's off on this uh, lovely raunt. It is necessary to boast. Uh, it's not uh, right that I do on the one hand, he admits, but I shall plunge on. That's the sense of elusimai. I shall plunge on into visions and revelations of the Lord. And that's where he's going to take us now. <laughs> so, um, uh, and then in verse 2, uh, oida anthropon, okay, so I've bolded this, this information, anthropon here, and then it's picked up later at the end of the verse, har, harpagenta ton toi uton. So I know a man in Christ, uh, 14 years ago. So what is this? And who is this person 14 years ago? Uh, who is it? I mean, I have no idea, but I do have that reference in uh, Galatians where he talks about um, after 14 years, and he's talking there about his own uh, conversion, 
Okay, so you wonder, is he talking about that? Is that, is that the connection? I just don't know. But, but he has this person in mind. And then he goes on, whether in the body I do not know, or whether outside the body I do not know. So Paul doesn't know, so I don't know either, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and uh, the whole thing could be kind of ironic, I think. Um, God knows, ha theos oiden, okay? And then he, this uh, perfect, uh, this aorist passive participle continues the connection then to, to anthropon, and then it's connected here, right here, uh, a man that was caught up such a one unto the third heaven. Okay, uh, now, so again, where is the third heaven? This is the only place you really have for this, uh, I thinking. It's famous, I mean, it's a famous part of Paul's theology, but it's not well substantiated elsewhere so far as I know. Okay, so, so he's kind of going out on a limb here. Um, I would, in preaching this, just state this, you know, that some of what Paul's uh, language is a bit mysterious here, but, but, but he has something here uh, that's important for us, okay? God knows, caught up such a one unto the third heaven. Um, and then he repeats the idea in verse 3. Indeed I know such a fellow, ton, to, toy uton anthropon, whether in the body uh, he was or outside the body, I do not know. God knows. So he repeats this idea, which means it's important, but even it's, though it's important, it's not well defined just exactly who he has in mind. I mean, I'm left scratching my head, and I'm not sure that you have to completely solve the problem uh, in order to preach on it. I think you can preach quite well on this, even if there's kind of some mystery here. The, the language is that way. Um, so we don't have to force it, I don't think, to, to say some Lutheran doctrinal point. You know, preach the text that you're given. Okay, um, so verse 4, uh, that he was caught up into paradise, hati uh, harpage eiston paradeson, kai ekusan aretai remata hauk exon, Anthropolalesi, and that he heard um, ineffable words, aretai remata, which are not permitted to a man to utter. Okay, and maybe that's why Paul is so kind of indirect here and mysterious, because he can't utter them. It's not given to a man to utter. Now, another uh, possibility here is that Paul could somehow be talking about maybe and it is a stretch, I admit, is he talking here about um, his own conversion experience where he has the encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, which is, is described three times in Acts, where he has uh, this encounter with, uh, with, with Christ, uh, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he says, who art thou, Lord? He calls him Kyrios there. And his conversion and how he is humbled. Now, is that what's meant by these ineffable words, the areta remata? Uh, um, probably not. I mean, I think the sense here is he's talking about some heavenly discourse that he was permitted to hear uh, in his... Uh, time on earth. Um, uh, we Christians, of course, are, are tied to the means of grace, to the word and sacrament, but we basically trust the experiences that were given to the apostles. Okay, so when, a, when an apostle has a, an encounter with the Lord, um, sees God in the flesh, as they do with Jesus, or when a prophet uh, has an encounter with Yahweh, we take that at face value if it's given in the Word. We always, of course, put our experiences under the Word, right? That's kind of the, the pattern here. But that doesn't mean that Paul, because he was the Lord's apostle, um, was bound the same way we are, okay? So, um, 
Anyway, he heard this, uh, th these, these words, uh, these ineffable words, which are not permitted to a man to speak. Verse 5, um, let's see. Um, uh, I, shall, uh, I, shall, I shall boast on behalf of such a one, um, uh, but um, I shall not boast on my own behalf except in my weaknesses. Okay? So um, maybe Paul is in fact talking about someone else, um, but he says here, if I'm going to boast in myself, it's going to have to be in my weaknesses, in my weaknesses. And here, of course, we have our weaknesses too. So there's a great kind of identity between Paul and, and us. For if I shall wish to boast, um, for if I wish to boast, verse 6, we have aeon, uh, aorist subjunctive, uh, so the protasis of either a future more vivid, which it is here because uk asamai is future. So if I, uh, if I do wish to boast, um, I shall not be a fool, for I speak true, aletheon gar ero. Okay? But uh, nevertheless, I'm uh, spared, lest someone um, uh, consider toward me beyond what he sees me or hears anything from me. So I think what Paul is saying here, I didn't check this against the English, but just in terms of the Greek, that um, uh, when you look at Paul, you can't just go on what you see or what you hear from him. Um, there's more to Paul than that. Yeah, you can sc screen up a little bit, John. Uh, screen up so that I have some room to work with. Okay, that's good. Um, so, uh, uh, um, so verse 7, uh, but, um, uh, but for a surpassingness of revelations, and this clause, the first part of verse 7, is just kind of stuck in here. I'm not quite sure how it fits. Uh, wherefore, uh, in order that I might not be puffed up, okay, so he kind of uh, comes down to reality here, uh, there was given to me the, the scolopes te sarki, the thorn in the flesh, the scolopes. I believe the scolopes is here, a, a, a hopox legomenon, and it's always um, uh, translated thorn in the flesh, whatever that is, and then he goes on here by apposition, and he calls it an angela satana, uh, a messenger of Satan, okay? Uh, so, um, the scolops, I believe, is neuter. I think it is. Um, you know what? I think I'm going to check that just right now. Maybe it's, maybe it's got gender. Scolops. Sorry about this. Scolops. It is. It's masculine. Scolops, scolopos, and they give the meaning thorn or splinter. That's the meaning that's given here in the Greek New Testament. So it is masculine, in fact. There was given to me a splinter in the flesh, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. Now, is, is this some type of a physical malady, or maybe it's a terrible person that enters Paul's life, a messenger of Satan? Could it be a rival preacher? Uh, one of his enemies. We know that Paul had enemies. It's just not clear, but this is a famous text, okay? In order to um, hina me kolafidze, kolafidzo is often translated beat, but it has to do with cuffing someone, especially a master cuffing a recalcitrant slave. That's the meaning that it has in 1 Peter, okay, which is where this word also occurs. Uh, in order that I might not be puffed up. So this scolops uh, that, uh, that the Lord gives um, is meant to humble Paul, to bring him down to earth out of the hot air balloon of these great uh, revelations and these mysteries, the way he's, he's carrying on as he does the beginning 
and he and it brings him down to earth. He's moored, just as every Christian is and must be, especially pastors have to be this way. Okay, so the, the things that God gives us, the problems that we have to put up with, the frustrations, the, the horrible people that sometimes pass our way are meant from this text to humble us to, uh, so that we might not be puffed up because otherwise we'd be up in the third heaven. And that's where we're tending anyway. And, and we want to hear these things that are ineffable words. Um, and we will in heaven. See, this is all pointed to heaven and being with the Lord forever and ever. That's where we're headed. But here on earth, we have these uh, things that, that keep us in our place, that, that cuff us, okay? This is not the heavy beating, but this is the cuffing, a shaming uh, that we have. We, we, we are shameful people. We have problems th this way. So go to town with this when you preach this. Every Christian has these experiences, and, and so did Paul, okay? Uh, verse 8, um, uh, uh, on, on behalf of this, or for this reason, thrice, um, I begged the Lord that he take it from me, okay? So here we have this henna right here, and then we have the aorist subjunctive, and I know you all think, you pastors that were raised on belts, that this is a purpose clause, but it's not a purpose clause, I'm telling you. It is, in fact, a um, justive noun clause, because you've got a, a verb of commanding. I beseech the Lord that he take. That's a JNC, a justive noun clause. It's a very common Latin construction. So every time you see henna with a subjunctive, don't always say it's purpose. Sometimes it's a JNC or indirect command. It's another name for it, okay, to, to take it from me. Uh, and he said to me, kai uh, ereken moi. Ereken, of course, is the perfect of lego, ero, apon, ereka. Okay, it's one of those irregulars you have to just know cold. So he uses the purpose there. Uh, the perfect there, and the perfect, is, as you know, has a past, past uh, significance and a, and a present connection. That's why perfects are tricky. So this one seems to be kind of located more in the past, I would say. And he has said, or uh, said in some point, and it's still true now to me, and then I put this in the red letter edition, what, what is said, and this is apparently a, a word from the Lord, okay? RK soy he charismu he gar dinamus in asthenea teletai. Okay, so my grace is sufficient for thee. Arco takes a dative object, as you would expect it does, and here it does here, uh, for um, uh, uh, power or my power, you get the my from the definite article here, for my power is made perfect, is completed in weakness. So it's, uh, it, the. I was checking this against the NIV translation and it was in red letter, so the editors of NIV think that this is something that maybe Jesus said to Paul, um, not in the Gospels, but this would be one of those, those rare um, utterances of Jesus that sometimes only occur in, in, in Paul. So that's something that he, he, he told uh, uh, Paul, apparently, uh, to bear up with this uh, affliction, this malady. Why? Because um, uh, Christ's grace is sufficient for thee. That's why. The charis. And unpack, you know, what charis means. Charis means God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what the word means. Now, last Sunday, if you were preaching uh, uh, on, on the previous one from uh, 2 Corinthians 8, Charis uh, has these technical significances, but here it really doesn't. It's talking about God's grace in Christ Jesus, for my power is, is made perfect in weakness. Okay? Um, so, Paul concludes. See this un here? Uh, concludes, a deduction. Uh, I shall rather uh, most pleasantly hatest a boast, continuing this boasting idea, in my weaknesses. Okay? 
uh, in order that, um, and this is kind of tricky, uh, the power of Christ may, this is always translated, rest on me, episkenose uh, ep eme, but you see the idea of tent, my, my uh, tent on me. Um, uh, so, um, um, uh, will, will rest upon me, the power of Christ may rest on me. If I'm weak in myself, then, then uh, Christ is strong in me. Uh, if, if I'm weak in my own powers and abilities, then Christ's gifts, his gospel, his Eucharist that I am privileged to partake of, my baptism into the dying and rising of Christ, that has the power and the, and, and the strength. That's, that's how it is for one who is a true Christian. And that's how it was for Paul. Um, in order that uh, the, the, the power of God may rest upon me, wherefore I rejoice in my weaknesses again, he says in verse 10, in my insults, hubresin, in ag anagkais, in my necessities, in my persecutions, in diogmois, di and in my uh, narrow straits, stenokoreis, um, on behalf of Christ. So he rejoices in them. Um, like, like it says in Acts that Peter and John were glad to be worthy of suffering for the name. Okay, when they were beaten, and they were. Um, okay, for um, whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Uh, Paul concludes the, um, the, the period powerfully and gloriously. So there's lots of good stuff uh, here for you to work with, and I pray that you uh, will have a fun time unpacking Paul, uh, getting to know his Greek, and sharing just a bit of this for your congregation. Thank you.